Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Well, I tell you what, when I see the, uh, the cross still up here with a garment on it, a robe, I, uh, I'm glad that we, we use symbols still to remind us of the greatest story ever told. The story that embodies and encapsulates the entire message that God tried so hard to tell the world. He told this story to begin with through the use of a people. We know them in scripture as the Israelite people. Why? Well, there was this guy, his name was Jacob, and he fought with an angel one night and the angel turned out to be God and he realized that he was fighting with God and he grabbed a hold of him and what did he say? I will not let you go. Lee gets 10 points. You guys got to be quicker than Lee. I will not let you go until you bless me. I don't know about you, but getting together with the people of God on Sabbath, one of the things that I look forward to is the blessing of God. Encapsulated in what happens next is the reason why we refer to these individuals as Israelites, because his name gets changed from Jacob to Israel, father of a great nation. Now we know that his grandfather was Abraham and that his father was Isaac and that he had lied to his father and then his his uncle, his mother's brother had turned that lie around on him and made him marry his, his future wife which was the sister of the woman he really wanted to marry. I mean Are you getting this down? Are you remembering this? Because this could have jumped out of the tabloids this week. It certainly would have been right there on the front page if we had had a story about somebody who married two of the same women, two of the same women from the same family, a sister duo. We certainly would have thought that there was something wrong going on if that had been the case. But this is the Bible story and his name was Jacob and, and, and he needed a change. And God gave him that change. And so the other week when we had Passover communion last, last month, for those of you who came, you, you got to experience communion coming out of the Passover. And Jesus, as you remember, celebrates that Passover with his disciples. And it's called the Last Supper now. And he, he does that thing where he says, this is my body and this is my blood. And, and, and that thing becomes our communion service. And so here we have the cross and we've had Easter And we've said to ourselves this month, first Sabbath, because he lives, I live. That was Jacob's experience. He held on to God and he said, you need to change me. I cannot change myself. And so God touches him in the hip. And you think, why would God... Give him a dislocated hip. I don't know what happened, but ever since then, the Israelite people never eat the sciatic nerve in the leg of a lamb. In honor of that moment when Jacob's hip was touched and he was made lame. But in that, what seemed to be a curse, you see Jacob leaning heavily on his staff hobbling out to meet Esau. Esau, his brother, who had sworn to kill him. You have anybody in your life like that? You feel like this week somebody was trying to kill you? The Bible tells us there is a roaring lion. I say he's got a few less teeth these days, but 
he's no less hungry for your destruction. There's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, the Bible says, and he's after you. If you didn't feel that this week, then uh, I don't know. Maybe you're already digesting in his belly. But here comes Esau. He is now going to do what he always said he would do. He is going to take back what he felt was his that was taken from him wrongly. And he was right. Mothers out there, you try to make things happen for your kids. Just remember what she did. She was the one who told Jacob, go kill a goat, put the skin on the arm. Your father won't know the difference because the angel told me that you would be the one to get the birthright. Remember that story? She was the one. Do you remember the price she paid? She never did see her son again. Hope the mothers are listening. God has a purpose for your children. And he will work out that purpose in their life because she helped him go on a trajectory of, of, of pain and agony that bring us to this moment where here, here comes Jacob and he's leaning on his, his staff and Esau, his twin, says, I can't kill this cripple. I can't. God crippled Jacob to save him. Comes up to, to Jacob. Jacob had strategically separated his family so that if Esau attacked part of his family, that only that part would be decimated because, you see, Esau was riding with 300 fighting men. 300. There was no chance for Jacob and his, his family. So he had to be as strategic as possible. And now he is coming back from this all-night wrestling session. He is crippled. And in that moment, in that moment, God saves him in his brokenness. Are you, are you hearing themes of other times when we have been together? In our brokenness, in our crippledness, God is seen to be the strong person. In our weakness, he is made strong. We had no way, we still don't have any way of saving ourselves. Are you hearing me? We are unable. He is able. He has made a way. And he has changed our name. As Adventists, we love to talk about Revelation. And I'm reminded that in Revelation chapter 3, <laughs> we are told that those who choose to follow the Lamb of God, remember he was the Passover Lamb, those who choose to follow the Lamb of God will be given a white stone with a new name. Wonder what that's going to be. Wonder what that's going to be. What what name what name will you get? What name will be will be given to you? So Jacob becomes Israel. Israel becomes a great nation. Uh, don't forget, Abraham had another son. What was his name? Ish Ishmael. How many sons did Ishmael have? Twelve. Interesting number, isn't it? Two generations later, Isaac and then Jacob. Jacob also has 12 sons. How many, how many gates into the new Jerusalem? Are you seeing a pattern here? Just understand that wherever you see 12 in the Bible, how many disciples were there? What is the number of humanity? I think I told you this one a couple of weeks ago. What, what day of the week did God make man? Six. Six is the number of human, humanity. Let's just say humanity. 
man is the word the Bible uses. Six is the number of humanity. Twelve is the number of the people of God. I have a friend in Arizona. Shout out to Bobby. This morning he's preaching on the 144,000. How do you get to 144,000 mathematically? Come on, you mathematicians. Twelve times twelve. 144. Okay? It's not a random number in the Bible. Twelve is a symbol of the people of God. So there is a people, there is a people that is brought into existence through a broken man named Israel, whom God blesses and says, you will be the father of a great nation. And I'm so glad that the Apostle Paul came along as a rabbi. He knew all about the history of Israel, and he tells us uh, Gentile believers that through Jesus, we can be grafted in and we too can become children of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. That we can become one of the tribes of Israel, if you like. To this group, Moses records the words of God in Deuteronomy chapter 6. So if you don't feel like you were a born Israelite, understand that the Apostle Paul tells you that through Jesus Christ, you are an Israelite. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 says, Hear, O Israel. So that's you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Jesus adds, And your neighbor as yourself. Very interesting that Solomon comes along after David. And as I was reading Ecclesiastes again this week, I came across the text that I chose for the call to worship today. It's an interesting text to read as an older person now. This is a king of Israel. This is the wisest person that ever lived. He was given the wisdom of God. That's why we say he was the wisest person, because he has God's wisdom. And now he is reflecting in, an, in, in his older life uh, about what has happened to him and what will happen to his stuff. Somebody else. And he even uses the word fool. Somebody else is going to get all my stuff. And I won't even have a say in it. And they will not have had to work for it. They're just going to get my stuff. Quick little advertisement. If you don't have a will or a trust, you're a very naughty naughty person. You may go home thoroughly spanked by your pastor today. This conference will help you. If you don't know, you should know that if you don't have a will, Uncle Sam will decide for you where your money goes. Just saying. And most of it will not go to your children or where you want it to go. So please, and please, Get a will. I don't care how you do it. The conference will do it for free. But get a will and especially get a trust. Put everything into a trust. I've got that for my mom. Please do it today. Set up an appointment. The man who does it is Brother Park. He comes to our church. Make an appointment with him and get a will. Chris and I are in the process of updating our will into California. So do it. You don't know when you might need it. Do it today. Solomon is interested in the fact that he will not have 
this very kind of directorial power over his stuff when he is gone. You can have that kind of power. You can say, I would like my assets to all go to my children. Solomon didn't have that kind of power. He did not know who it would be of his sons, of the many, many children that he fathered, who it would be that would actually get to the fore. And we know, because we know the history of Israel, that there were some very nasty people that came after Solomon, and they did not do good things with all that he had amassed. Amazing, amazing that God would bring into the land of Israel a people who, if you read the end of the book of Deuteronomy, he tells Moses first before Moses dies, and then Joshua, these people will not follow me. They will leave me and forsake me. And then you read Joshua 1.9, and you read actually the end of the book of Deuteronomy, and he says, oh, but anyway, be strong and courageous. So if you're a parent today and you had God uh, telling you, you know, your children are not going to listen to you. Your children don't care what you say. They're not going to follow. You're going to go away and they're not going to follow. How would you feel? I'm so glad that he does say to us as parents today, he does say to us as a church, be strong and courageous anyway. Go ahead, go into this land. I'm going to give you this land. And in this land, he says to them, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love, love the Lord our God, the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Jesus meets up with Nicodemus. He has an appointment made and he meets Nicodemus in the way that he would like to meet. He doesn't force Nicodemus out into the open. And you can count on the fact that that same God, that same Jesus will meet you anywhere you want. Anytime you want. He's not going to embarrass you. But he will meet with you. He meets with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and it's an incredible, incredible moment. Jesus says some things Nicodemus does not understand, and Jesus tells him that he is surprised that he does not understand. The fact is, though, I believe that we are still maybe like Nicodemus. How, How much do we understand this God, this God that is told to us in Deuteronomy that we need to hear. We need to hear, O Israel, that the Lord our God is one and that we are to love the Lord our God. You see, Nicodemus has a picture of God. Nicodemus has this idea that he thinks is God. Here sits Jesus, very unexpectedly coming from nowhere in Nazareth, doesn't come up through the Sanhedrin, and this man is now saying to him, you are a teacher of Israel, and you do not understand where the power comes from. You do not understand God and what he is trying to do with all humanity. Nicodemus, I believe, is pretty much stunned into silence. It's later on in the chapter that we read that verse in in, in, in verse 16. We, We all know this verse. That God loves the entire world. Nicodemus, you see, comes from this, this Israelite people. He has this picture of God that he feels is very specifically aimed at the people of God. And now God himself 
comes to him by night, has an interview with him and says, Nicodemus, don't you know that this promise that comes through the people of Israel that will be a blessing to all the world is for all the world. That he loved the whole world so much that he gave his only begotten son. Now, Jesus in that, in that interview does not say what he says to the lady at the well. Do you remember? She is one of the only people that Jesus actually admits. I am he. I, I'm, I'm the one that the scriptures have told the people of God that the Messiah is coming and he's going to come through the people of God. The Israelite. He's going to be an Israelite. I'm I'm he. I'm he. He doesn't tell Nicodemus. He's telling Nicodemus that, that he's surprised he doesn't understand. That unless you grab on to the ideas that, that I'm telling you and be born again, then really you're not part of this whole thing that's going on. I'm sure Nicodemus was quite stunned to know this. But today, I wonder whether, like Nicodemus, we think that we know God. I don't know if that, if that just twists you a little bit. I know it twists me to think, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm like Nicodemus. Maybe I think I know. Maybe there's something else God, God wants me to know. He tells us in the Shema, which is this phrase, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That's known as the Shema. He tells us about the kind of God that he is and the relationship that he wants to have with everyone. It's important, I believe, that we understand God because we as a people, as a, I'm being very specific here, we as a Seventh-day Adventist people are quite audacious, wouldn't you say? <laughs> we, we actually say that we have an end-time message. That is an audacious claim. I'm not backing away from it, believe me. But I just want you to know that there are millions of Christians in North America today who believe in another way that the world will end, and they believe that it will be the Jewish people who will come to an understanding of Jesus and accept him as their savior and be the last warning message to the world. This is after, of course, the secret rapture. Those that are left behind will be evangelized by the Jewish people who at that time will come to a belief in the Messiah known as Jesus Christ. Millions of Baptists believe that. So they're not looking for the Adventist church to come along and say, we have an end time message. Because no, we, we don't believe in a secret rapture and we, we don't count prophecy maybe in the way that they count prophecy. And so we have this different idea about how it's going to end. In fact, some of our brethren, this was given to me by uh, one of our sisters, decided to put a large ad in the L.A. Times. Okay? It has an explanation, a fairly accurate explanation, of the three angels' messages. So that was in your paper, going out to however many thousands of people get the L.A. Times, to let them know that there, are, there is a message from heaven that is needing to be given and that these people, they're actually from South Dakota, believe that the people of Los Angeles need to hear this message. 
I'm glad. I'm glad they put that out there. But I also would like us to be thinking about how we relate to that because we believe that we have this, this end time message and that it's here to be told in Santa Clarita. And, and that really it, it, it is a message of love. The love of God compels him to work with us to save other people. Um, in, in my reading this week, I was in my office and I, I found a very old book. Some of you may recognize it because it's an old edition from Pacific Press by a lady named Ellen White. It is called Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers. How many of you would consider yourself a gospel worker? What, no hands? How many of you would consider yourself a minister? Well, maybe you, maybe I need to do a whole series on this. What, am I the only minister here? You say, well, yes, you're, you're the pastor. You're, you're, you're the minister. You're the one who gets to pronounce people, right? Well, that's what they say. That's what the government says. But the Bible says, the Bible says those who call upon the Lord and say yes to Jesus, you become a minister and you are called and you are given the, uh, the, the work of going and telling the good news. Would you agree with that? Would you say that I have been chosen to call, being called to tell the good news? Would you agree with that? Okay, then you're a gospel worker. So I guess what she says applies to you as well. And basically what she says in the chapter that I read, page 120 and onward, the fact is, the fact is that she is, in, is telling us that there needs to be a hunger, there needs to be a hunger for the lost. Now what is the lost? I'm going to quickly define that for you. It's very simple. The lost are people who don't know Jesus. The lost are people who have disconnected from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and are going their own way, or at least they think it's their own way, because really it's not. It's a way that's directed by the evil one. Only two roads in the world, we know this. And the road to the, 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 the demise of human civilization is wide, the Bible tells us, and the road to, to, to heaven, the road that is supposedly upward, and narrow, this is, this is the road that, that we are asked to walk and we're asked to, to, to be feeling a sense of loss in our own lives if we do not have the people that we love next to us, either physically or, or mentally or emotionally, that we, that we haven't told them that Jesus loves them that he died to save them, and that he's coming back to get them. Okay? I, I don't know if this smites your conscience. I know it smites my conscience. She is speaking to me. She is, she is saying, we have a message, we have an end time message that needs to be given to our neighbors and our friends. And my, my dear brothers and sisters, it is a message of the love of God. The first angel says, pay attention to this God. Who, which God? Well, it's the God who made you. The God who loves you. Second angel says, you know what, there's, there's, this, there's this rebellion going on in the world, and, 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 and you know, if you're part of those who are rebelling against God, it's time for you to come out of that and rejoin, reconnect to God, and do a life that is, that is led by this one God. Behold our God, hear O Israel, our, the Lord our God is one, the triune God. And that... that the third angel's message is all about the fact that this other kingdom in this world is crumbling. It's going down. It's not going to survive. Now, if you were on the Titanic and you were, you were knowing because of history, you were sent back there and you were on the Titanic and you knew that it was going to hit the iceberg, what would you do? 
well, you, you'd not get on. <laughs> Good choice. But if you knew there were thousands of people and, and you're on this boat and you know that it's going down, what would you do? You would go to the captain and you would say, you need to watch out. You're heading towards an iceberg. And if he didn't listen, then you'd go to the first mate. And if he didn't listen, then you'd go. This is what Ellen says we should be doing. If people don't listen, don't worry about that. Go to somebody else. Doesn't matter who they are. They all need to know that Jesus loves them. Jesus died to save them. All of them, John 3.16 says. Doesn't matter if they're high up, if they're medium, or if they're low born. Yes, I, I watched that movie, Victoria and Abdul. Amazing how we can discriminate against and against individuals who are not like us. For any reason. When we do that, we are not listening to our Heavenly Father. When we judge people, we are not listening to our Heavenly Father. Jesus says, For God so loved everybody that He set in motion a plan to save as many as would say yes to him. He doesn't want to leave anybody behind. No person has this for a change in that phrase. No child left behind? No, that's not what he says. Maybe he says, no child of mine. And how many children are there of God's on planet Earth? Seven point something billion now, right? All made in his image. Born at his direction, alive for a purpose. Don't think that you're alive for no purpose. Don't think that you're here for a random, because of a random night of, 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 of wild partying. I mean, come on. Some people say, oh yeah, you know, my parents really didn't want me. Some of you know Fred Hammond. He's written a lot of really great gospel songs. I saw a YouTube about him this week where he, he, is, he, he is here because God wants him to be here because his mother tried to have an abortion and it didn't work. Three, four, five days later, he was still alive and he was given life. Fred Hammond, who has blessed this world with amazing music, devil tried to kill him at birth. And God said, no, I need you here. I, I want you here. So if you are hearing me today, God needs you, wants you, will work with you to be a, you know, in, in your life, in your situation, he will work to help you to be a part of what he is doing. Many people worry that they don't come to church. I say, be more worried that you are not representing your heavenly father. Church is here just to help remind you the bigger relationship, the more important relationship is whether or not you are following your heavenly father. Whether you, like the Shema says, are giving him your whole heart, you're giving him your whole soul, whether you're giving him your whole effort, I'm going to use that word instead of strength, everything that you are is bent on doing what it is that he wants to be to, to have done. Let's end with the picture of a man walking with his donkey. Some feel that it was the Wadi Kelt, which is a ravine that's still there in Israel today. And it's between Jericho and Jerusalem. The man's walking. Maybe he's going to Jerusalem. Donkey is tired, so he's walking, and his donkey is carrying his packs. He's a businessman. And 
He's a Samaritan. He knows that when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to face persecution. He's going to face mean looks because the people there will not really want to do business with him because he's a dirty Samaritan. And as he's thinking about this on the way out of the corner of his eye, he sees a foot in the dirt. He looks over, and it's not just a foot, it's a leg, and that leg is attached to a body, and behind the rock he finds a man that is mostly dead. Remember Princess Bride? He's not dead. He's just mostly dead. He's mostly dead. He's been beaten. He's been kicked. He's been hacked on. And he's been left for dead, and he's naked. He has nothing. The man carefully ministers to him, uses the available substances that he has with him. No, he doesn't have Tylenol. No, he doesn't have bandages. He uses his own clothing as strips. He rips things up. He takes olive oil and he takes wine and he cleanses. He dresses the wounds and then he puts this half-dead, mostly dead guy on his own donkey. Instead of riding it himself, he puts him on his own donkey and carries him, shoulders him along as they hobble to the next rest stop. This scene is as amazing to us as it was to the listeners in Jesus' day, except that we should understand that the listeners in Jesus' day were church people just like us. Jesus is not talking to people who don't understand because we know the first part of the story has really hit home because the two guys that went past this mostly dead guy were a priest, a religious leader, and a Levite. And because of their understanding of, of their religion, they believe that touching a dead body would disqualify them from doing their religious duties. And so therefore their religious duties ranked higher than ministering to the mostly dead guy. Do you see what I'm saying? I don't know if you're hearing this. Maybe I could say this. Is, is, is coming to church and paying your tithe and, and, and being seen in all the right places important to you or thank, thank God thank God that some of you today put something in the offering plate for family promise because on your behalf people like Naomi and Inga and others spent their lives this week to help the two families that are still going to stay tonight in our classroom they're doing this on your behalf. Family Promise is doing this on your behalf. I'm so glad, honestly, that we have this opportunity to, to share our space with individuals who have no shelter. It gives me probably the best feeling about our facility to be able to do that. Now, we also share with a fantastic daycare there are 75 families who come in and out of this property every day, all week long. I love sharing. There's another congregation that sits in these pews tomorrow, every Sunday, every Wednesday night. Come Wednesday night. Come pray with them. They really pray. They pray local. They pray far away. They pray for people on Wednesday night. If you want to come pray with them, come pray with them. It doesn't matter that there's a different leadership group, don't, don't worry. They are praying in the name of Jesus on Wednesday night here in this church. And they would welcome you if you wanted to be here. I've come. It's a wonderful service that they do. Sharing. He's got the man on the donkey. He's sharing. He put his own 
wine, olive oil. He fixed him up, takes him to the inn. And this is where it just gets amazing. He pulls out his wallet and he pulls out his gold card and he puts it on the table and says, here, I'm paying for as many nights as he needs. I'm going to be coming back this way and so I'll sign the check then and I'll pay you any extra that you need in order to take care of this, this man. The likelihood was this was a Israelite who had been brought up to hate Samaritans. Are you getting the, the gravity of the story? I mean, think of, think of who you might have been brought up to not like. Because Jesus would be telling a story about that person if you were there. Oh yeah, those fill in the blank. Not really happy if they come to church. Folks, Jesus messed with Nicodemus that night. He really messed him up when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave the Messiah. To everyone. I don't know about you, but that kind of messes me up too. Because it, it takes away any excuse that I might have to not love everyone. Because you see, if I say that I'm connected to Jesus, if I say that I am a Christian, then that says that I love like Jesus loves. Period. Takes away any, any excuse that I might have for not wanting to associate with this person or that group or this orientation. Takes it away. Because you see, God came to this world through Jesus Christ and showed us how. Ellen says that if we're connected to him, the way that that will play out is that we will start loving people and hungering for people to be with Jesus like we are with Jesus. That's, that's, that's bottom line. That's why I called today, kind of finishing up the series, because he loves. I love. He lives in me, Christ in me. That's, that's what we say, Christ in me, the hope of glory. How about this? Christ in me means that I can love like Jesus loves. Because the fact is, you and I both know that we can't love people the way that Jesus loves people unless he is living inside of us, unless he has taken control of our minds and now we are thinking differently and this this old creature has become a new creature. This old brain has become a new brain and we're thinking differently. And we're, lo we're, 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 we're hoping against hope that there'll be someone else who will love Jesus because of a kind word, because of an action that takes place again and again and again. There's no guarantee. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I'll just say that this week, I've learned a little bit about the families. One of the families, this is not their first contact with Adventism. But she, she said, hey, when I saw that we were going to stay at the Adventist church, I was so happy. And I, you know what? It made me feel really good because whatever happened to her in the past made her feel that being with Adventist people was a good thing. Wouldn't, wouldn't you feel good about that? I mean, as a pastor, I, I feel good about that. <laughs> that. That people would say, hey, you know, those Adventists, being with them, is, that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it makes me feel good. But, you know, more than that, I want God to be happy with what we do. Amen. So that's my prayer for you and for us today, is that because he loves, we will love. Amen.